guys, Murgerman4 here, and with Doctor Who's 60th anniversary just around the corner, I thought now would be the perfect time to celebrate some of the best this franchise has to offer. Bringing Doctor Who into a bold new era, Christopher Eccleston's Ninth Doctor retains the goofiness and zest for life of his predecessors, but with an edge. The wounds of the Time War still cut deep, despite his best efforts to hide it. He may have had just one season on TV, but having recently returned to the role on audio, we now have a new chapter to explore. So why don't we take a look at my top 10 Ninth Doctor stories. Number 10, Freight Motif. It was word of my mother. She died last month. Artie. I was saving up for passage back home and Maurice has been so kind, letting me stay in the hotel rent free, but, but I haven't told them. Yesterday there was another, they couldn't wait. Of course they couldn't wait. They wanted her buried before Christmas, so the funeral's been and gone, and I'm just here, and I'm... I'm so sorry, Artie. I can't help thinking what a bad son I've been. Grief and loss. We all deal with it in different ways, and Fright Motif provides us with a wonderful little character study set in post-war Paris, introducing us to musician Artie Berger, a man who's recently lost his musical mojo and is struggling to find out why. Enter the Doctor. Christopher Eccleston really feels at home in these character pieces, and even though it's not directly touched on, the Doctor's recent crisis of identity in the Time War lends itself to this kind of quieter story and deep reflection. That's not to say that Fright Motif isn't without its moments of action. Indeed, there's a monster on the loose, a being of sound, and there's some exciting chases to be had and traps to be sprung. But it's all there to serve that story of grief, which, as it transpires, is what has attracted the creature to Artie in the first place. Having recently lost his mother, but unable to travel home to America for a funeral, Artie has been left distraught without being able to properly mourn. Similarly, his manager, Maurice, has lost his partner and has been privately facing the aftermath, but reveals the truth before sacrificing himself to save Artie's life. It's a touching culmination of events, and there's some really strong performances from all involved. Freight Motif may not reinvent the wheel, but what it does do is provide a solid hour of entertainment with some compelling commentary on grief and the ways it manifests itself, and ultimately, how it can be overcome. Number 9. Battle Scars You were watching that, Connie said, but did nothing. It's not for me to interfere besides. It's not my fault the mouse was stupid enough to get so close to the cat. Perhaps you didn't put it in danger, but if you saw what was happening and did nothing, you might as well have done. Or do you not believe that every life is precious? Even the life of a mouse? Connie Daniels, said the doctor, as his face lit up with a big grin. Have I told you that you're pretty fantastic? The Ninth Doctor has yet to receive an official post-regeneration story, but Battle Scars makes an admirable attempt to fill that gap. Even if it doesn't come directly after the Day of the Doctor, the regeneration is clearly recent, and the trauma of the Time War looms large. Crash landing in a garden in 1912, he's taken in by the Daniels family, quickly forming a bond with young Connie, whose innocence and thoughtfulness helps him to reflect on himself and truly begin his long journey of healing, which will culminate at the end of Series 1. Likewise, the Doctor shares much in common with Connie's father, Arthur, who is recovering from his time in the Boer War. Obviously, the details are different, but both have witnessed terrible events and harrowing experiences. And giving the Doctor someone that he can relate to, even through broad terms, is a dynamic that works really well. Indeed, the relatively small stakes of the story is one of its greatest assets. After the universe-ending events the Doctor faced time and again in the Time War, it's rejuvenating for him to spend time with a single struggling family in their day-to-day -day life, and as they help him recover, help them in return. Notably, the story builds off a moment in Rose, culminating in the Doctor's discovery that the Daniels were mere weeks away from a trip across the Atlantic on none other than the Titanic. And before he leaves, he takes their tickets, thus saving their lives. Battle Scars is a small-scale story that does big work for the Ninth Doctor's character arc, perfectly setting up the journey we see him take on television and reminding him that even after all he did in the war, he is still the Doctor. Number 8. Station to Station we lock minds and wrestle for the knowledge of the other's name. Three guesses each, and I've been called a lot of names in my time. Who knows? You might get lucky. You know the old ways, that's a clue. And it would be fun to destroy you. Then you accept. My interests cannot be denied. But let's take this little fight. Outside. 
turning the Ninth Doctor into one of my favorite types of Doctor Who stories, Station to Station traps him in a bizarre, rule-breaking environment and pits him up against an all-powerful foe. The foe in question is the Grimini Groove. Yes, a silly name, and this is enhanced by the accompanying rhyming, but the contrast of that silliness with the creature ominously stalking the Doctor and Co. through a shifting abandoned train station is actually really unsettling. I can see that it might not work for everyone, but it really worked for me. Arriving on an empty train platform, the Doctor quickly realizes something's off and becomes separated from the TARDIS. It's quite a creepy environment to be trapped in, and the story utilizes it to strong effect. Additionally, we get a really strong one-off companion in the form of Saffron Windrose, a woman feeling a bit lost as she struggles with her parents' lack of support and acceptance. There are some lovely character beats as the Doctor provides the emotional support that she's sorely lacking, and the unpredictable, shifting environment around them is a good reflection of her mental state. The story takes a bit of a fairy tale twist as it approaches its climax, with the Doctor realizing the power behind the Grimini Gru is its true name, and they have an entertaining battle of words trying to outguess each other, to which the Doctor ultimately succeeds. Maybe it's too easy a way out, but I had fun with it nonetheless. A memorable monster and a strong guest companion for the Ninth Doctor to bounce off of makes Station to Station a success in my books. Number seven, Girl Deconstructed. Hello, police, please. Why can't you see me? I want to report my daughter missing. I'm not missing. Marnie McDonald. She's 15. She didn't come home last night. I haven't left the house. I think she might have run away. I haven't. Dad, I'm here. I'm, I'm right here, Dad. Please, help me. Somebody, please help me. Girl Deconstructed opens with a simple but frighteningly effective cold open as we discover teenager Marnie has effectively become a ghost. Hearing her anguished attempts to get her father's attention as he calls the police to file a missing persons report makes for a strong hook, and using this disappearance to explore a teenager's complicated relationship with her father works really well. I really like the idea of a bunch of teenagers suddenly vanishing, but not actually going anywhere. In Marnie's case, at least, it allows her a new perspective on her father, to see how much he truly cares about her. And the eventual explanation for these disappearances a migrating race of aliens picking up on teenagers' subconscious, often temporary, wishes to flee home and trying to help them achieve that desire is refreshingly unique. The Ninth Doctor feels incredibly at home in this kind of domestic setting, and we get some really great moments such as Detective Jaina Lee answering the missing person's call only to discover the Doctor already on the case, or the Doctor moving the TARDIS to Marty's house but arriving before his past self left. Little moments that just add a sparkle of Doctor Who magic to proceedings. Eccleston himself is on top form here, effortlessly taking command and joyously celebrating when he successfully returns everyone home, and previously mentioned Jaina Lee fills in the companion role admirably. It's a fun story with a strong emotional core that achieves its ambitions to great effect. Number six, Salvation Nine. What does that look like to you up there? It is shorter than the other figures. That's a Sontaran. He has no face. It's a helmet. Armor. So you could provide us with the true meaning of all this nonsense. <laughs> this is wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Fantastic. It shows how a single Centauran squadron began wiping out an entire people. The people of this forest. A genocide. We don't know that word. Well, you do now. Salvation Nine takes the Centaurans and asks a question. What if a group of them didn't die in battle? What if they lived on to discover there's more to life than war? What if they forgot their heritage and created a simple, peaceful society? It's a bold move, taking a species that's all about warfare and stripping that away from them. But writer Timothy X. Attack delivers a heartfelt script that delves into prejudice and preconception, as the Doctor has to save this innocent splinter group from annihilation purely because Sontarans as a whole are known for warfare. True, even the Doctor's skeptical. But he takes the opportunity to hear them out, and what we get is a wonderfully bizarre twist on one of Doctor Who's most iconic monsters. We're even treated to the Sontaran interpretation of singing. It's a great deal of fun, and the resolution further flips this on its head by having these new Sontarans pretend to be regular Sontarans in order to save the day. Together, they must capture a Sontaran leader who will denounce them, convincing the humans that they aren't a threat. I have to give kudos to all the main cast here. Eccleston is, of course, superb, playing the joy of this discovery with a real verve, and Sontaran stalwart Dan Starkey does an excellent job setting these new Sontarans apart, alongside guest star Josie Lawrence. All told, 
Salvation 9 is a fun twist on an old foe that has real heart and is a great joy to listen to. Number 5. Monsters in Metropolis. What do you think? It was beautiful. It was, wasn't it? You always gain from seeing these things on the big screen. It's like watching it with a whole new pair of eyes. I am watching it with a whole new pair of eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose you are. Seems like it's a day for new experiences. Going to the cinema with a Cyberman. I'm pretty certain I never expected that. As soon as Eccleston was announced to be joining Big Finish, the top of my wish list was a Cyberman story. And Monsters in Metropolis doesn't disappoint. One of the story's greatest advantages is its setting. Taking place on the set of the iconic silent film Metropolis, it's a lot of fun hearing the Doctor fanboying about the film and its production, and sets it apart from most other historical stories, which have very rarely touched on the history of film. It's also a perfect fit for the Cybermen. Slotting one into the place of the famous robot is a clever move that feels entirely natural. Indeed, the Cybermen itself is used to great effect here. Having crash-landed, its systems malfunctioning, its original personality has started to reassert itself. But a man called Dieter found the Cyberman and discovered a way to control it, using it to infiltrate Metropolis production in an attempt to prevent its message of peace from reaching the masses. It's an interesting twist to not only have the Cyberman be committing murder against its will, but to be fighting against a human captor rather than its own cyber programming. And it's oddly beautiful when the Doctor is able to free it and takes it to see the finished Metropolis. Yes, that's right. This is a story where the Doctor goes to the movies with a Cyberman, and as ridiculous as it sounds, it's genuinely quite emotional. Full of heart, an interesting step in the history, and an utterly unique take on the Cybermen, Monsters in Metropolis is nothing short of a massive success. Number four, Father's Day. I should have known. It's not about showing you the universe. It never is. It's about the universe doing something for you. So it's okay when you go to other times and you save people's lives, but not when it's me saving my dad. I know what I'm doing. You don't. But it's not like I've changed history. Not much. I mean, he's never going to be a world leader. He's not going to start World War Three or anything. Rose, there's a man alive in the world who wasn't alive before. An ordinary man. That's the most important thing in creation. The whole world's different because he's alive. Father's Day is one of Doctor Who's most personal, poignant stories, where the sci-fi takes a back seat and the character drama is allowed to shine. Oftentimes, these kinds of stories are reserved for historicals, and I suppose Father's Day matches that category to a point. Except this time we're delving into a companion's personal history, as Rose wishes to meet her father who died when she was a baby. But things quickly spiral out of control when she instinctively saves his life, something which has dire consequences and leads to a falling out between the Doctor and Rose. Rarely has a Doctor-Companion relationship been challenged like this. And while the Doctor's obviously right to be angry, it's easy to forget that Rose is only 19. Despite everything she's been through, she's barely an adult and still has a lot to learn. And frankly, how many of us would be able to resist that sort of temptation? But ultimately, this story's success derives from Rose's interactions with her father. He's smart enough to work out who she is on his own and see through her lies that he ended up being the dad Rose always wanted. It's heartbreaking to see his realization that he was never there for his little girl, but now he's offered the chance to make it up to her. When the Doctor's plan fails, the only option left is to ensure history remains intact by killing himself. It's a beautiful sacrifice full of courage and enabling him to finally be a proper dad to Rose. And it's bittersweet as he acknowledges how thankful he is for the few hours they've had together. It's a stunning piece of work that's wonderfully beautiful and utterly heartbreaking. Rarely has a Doctor Who story been so emotionally impactful as this. Number three, Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways. You really want to think about this, because if I activate the signal, every living creature dies. I am immortal. Do you want to put that to the test? I want to see you. Become like me. Hello, the Doctor, the Great Exterminator! I'll do it! Then prove yourself, Doctor! What are you, coward or killer? Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways is the culmination of the Ninth Doctor's era, masterfully bringing together the story threads that have been introduced throughout the season and serving as a rare example of a Doctor Who finale that doesn't fumble the landing in the slightest. Brilliantly, it starts out as a seemingly standalone episode, with the Doctor, Jack, and Rose kidnapped from the TARDIS and placed within some futuristic and deadly versions of modern-day game shows. 
This is a concept that could honestly sustain a story all on its own, and it's a great commentary in the vein of vengeance on Veritas. How far will we go for entertainment? But this story's got a lot more to do, and slowly but surely, we peel back the layers, impressively building off almost every episode of the season. We also get a wonderful could-have-been companion in Linda Moss, whom the Doctor saves from the games. She's a bit timid, but as the Doctor says, she's sweet and clearly has a good heart, more than willing to offer her help, which makes her eventual death all the more distressing. Indeed, this story has a high death toll, in a fantastic reveal, assuming you haven't seen last episode's Next Time trailer, it transpires that the Daleks are behind it all. A single ship having escaped the Time War and having been gradually harvesting humanity and converting them into a vast Dalek army. Earlier in the season, the Doctor came face to face with a lone Dalek, unleashing his trauma, and Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways builds on that exquisitely by forcing the Doctor to make the same choice he made to defeat the Daleks in the Time War. He could wipe them all out, but at the cost of humanity. And it's here where the Ninth Doctor's arc finally reaches its pinnacle. While before he needed Rose to pull him back from the brink, now, having sent her home, refusing to let her into harm's way, he makes the ultimate choice. Coward, any day. It's a fantastic moment that sums up exactly who the Doctor strives to be, and it's the perfect conclusion to the Ninth Doctor's arc. And to top it off, we get one of the show's greatest ever regenerations with the day saved and the Doctor optimistically facing the future. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Number two, The Empty Child and the Doctor Dances. What are you doing? Software patch. Gonna email the upgrade. You want moves, Rose? I'll give you moves. Everybody lives, Rose. Just this once! Everybody lives! Stephen Moffat's first contribution to the mainline show sets a precedent for much of his later work, absolutely scaring the pants off you while delivering a message of love and hope. Tracking a mysterious object through the time vortex, the Doctor and Rose end up in the midst of World War II, and what we get is a perfect blend of history and sci-fi. We really get a feel for the period, experiencing the horror of war from a civilian perspective, and more specifically, through children separated from their parents. Moffat takes advantage of that inherent drama, cleverly tying it in with his main monster, a lost boy looking for his mummy. And that's the other brilliance of this story. The threat is not only drawn from the time period, but from something so innocent. The haunting image of a child in a gas mask whose mere touch can end your life is a far more terrifying prospect than most traditional monsters. Beyond that, the idea behind it, physical injury is plague caused by nothing malicious, but instead alien nanobots that simply don't understand humanity and don't realize they're causing harm, is genius, and perfectly sets up the resolution whereby the Doctor discovers the process can be reversed, joyously declaring that just this once, everybody lives. It's a trope that I think Moffat became a bit too fond of using later on, but it works brilliantly here, and giving the Ninth Doctor a true, definitive victory after all the suffering he's experienced is, well, fantastic. Additionally, it's here that we're introduced to fan-favorite character, Captain Jack Harkness, a con man from the 51st century who's charming, capable, and misguided, but willing to grow and change. It's a great introduction to the character, with John Barrowman turning in an incredibly charismatic performance. It's little wonder that he would go on to front his own spin-off, and he forms an immediate rapport with the Doctor and Rose that's great fun to watch. Utterly terrifying and beautifully heartwarming, The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances is Stephen Moffat at his very best, a superb story that's rightly gone down as a modern day classic. And before we reach my number one Ninth Doctor story, let's take a quick look at some honorable mentions which very nearly made the cut. Rose. Her own bootstraps. Break the ice. Retail Therapy The End of the World Number 1 Dalek If you want orders, follow this one Kill yourself The Daleks must survive! The Daleks have failed! Why don't you finish the job and make the Daleks extinct? Rid the universe of your filth! Why don't you just die? Dalek is a masterpiece. 
There, enough said. No, I should probably expand on that a bit. But truly, every aspect of the story is pure gold. Up until this point, we've gotten hints towards the fate of the Doctor's people, a horrible war that he fought in, and here, everything is brought to the forefront, with the Doctor confronted with a lone survivor, the last of the Dalek race. The Doctor's first encounter with the Dalek is phenomenal, with Christopher Eccleston firing on all cylinders. This scene alone brings him through sheer terror, manic joy, horrific grief, and terrible rage. The Dalek brings out the absolute worst in the Doctor, and we begin to see the true damage he carries with him breaking through the shell he's put around himself. It's only Rose who's able to pull him back from the brink, who reminds him who he is and who he needs to be. And that point couldn't be better demonstrated than by Rose becoming more scared of the Doctor than she is the Dalek. It's incredible character work, dare I say it, perhaps the best the series has ever seen, and it never fails to give me chills. And what of the eponymous Dalek? Well, like the Doctor, it's used to incredible effect. I'm not sure the Daleks have ever been scarier than they are here, and a large part of that is by emphasizing just how dangerous a single Dalek can be. The story fully convinces you that one Dalek, all on its own, would spell doom for planet Earth. It's utterly terrifying and a perfect reintroduction of the Doctor's greatest enemies for a whole new audience. And that's not to mention the superb setting of an alien museum hidden underground, the fantastically atmospheric score by Murray Gold, and a host of memorable guest characters. Dalek is nothing short of perfection. Not just the greatest of the Ninth Doctor's era, but one of the greatest stories the show has ever told across its 60-year history. But what do you think? Were there any surprise inclusions? Did I leave out your top choice? Let me know what your favorite Ninth Doctor stories are down in the comments below. And with that, Murgerman 4, over and out, and I'll see you all next week with my top 10 Tenth Doctor stories. Thank <laughs> you.